1890, there were really quacks and, and really uh, medicine, <clears throat> and anybody could really say they were a doc, and everybody could. <clears throat> and um, in the 1910, this Flexer review on medical schools, huge thing, and I only mention it because a lot of medical schools as not being legitimate, and uh, and then they they had to come in order to become a registered medical school. Remember, the only research institution in the country was Hopkins. All the rest had no interest in research. It was not part of the schedule. It was not part of something they did at a medical school. So the Flexer Report really changed medicine in a dramatic way. And this is before, <clears throat> wow, before the uh, yeah, Washington uh, was even established. So then when you came to the early 1900s, you had this, we had a big influenza in 1918. We had gone to war in Europe. Became the next thing in Toronto when they discovered insulin, 1920. So uh, here we are in medicine. So I think it's interesting. I'm not going over all of them, but at the top you realize that the would be causing scarlet fever. You had you had a BCG, and we still don't have a vaccine for tuberculosis. We had pernicious anemia, we had thyroxin was synthesized, parathyroid hormone was isolated, and the lung, the iron lung was for polio, uh, was developed before the depression <clears throat> as they came down. <clears throat> then the stock market died, and then for the first time we started to get sulfa drugs just before the Second World War. And, uh, <clears throat> and then Came in in 38. So most of us who were in medical in the 60s were seeing the beginning of real treatment with and not knowing any of the complications at that time. Finally, there's, um, <clears throat> there are products really start. They really didn't start in regular use in 44. And then we had Kaiser Permanente start, and that started because and the shipyard needed to get insurance for what then became. And so out of all of that came Car uh, uh, Kaiser Permanente and the whole thing. But it started really for the team that was working at the shipyard, and that's how that uh, all started. And then uh, in 1916, uh, Seattle stopped. So now we go into the prohibition time. And it was a little ahead of the country, but it, they made it illegal. For us, the Puget Sound became the first time when we really had blood available to do surgery. Water was fluorinated. And in 61, we started the World Health Organization, uh, which was part of the U became part of the UN. And the end of smallpox was in about '63. I tell you all these things because I think they relate. Because their transfusions, they tried to do transfusions direct, person to person, and that was a, a complete failure. And uh, when they failed, this was because we didn't know we didn't even have the Rh factors at that time. And here in Seattle, the first dialysis from Scribner was the person who really established that at the university here, actually. And, uh, and then we, the ambulance and the idea of transfusing patients really came about. So where did the University of Washington come from? Well, the University of Washington was really a golf course. And the golf course is what you see at top. Today is what it looks like at the bottom. 
And uh, the first class to come out was in, it was, 1850, it was in 1950. So we're really a young place of only uh, 60 years since we've had a, a class graduate from medical school. And, uh, and now the University of Washington is the second largest federally granted university in the country. <clears throat> so it's, um, it's come a long way. This is the present campus. These were some of the, uh, the deans that became involved in what is known as whammy. And so when you come here, you realize that, that there is an organization between Washington, Montana, Idaho, and Alaska, and they formed the whammy uh, and Idaho, formed the uh, whammy session. So in these states, there's only a two-year a two-year basic science medical school. And then they all come to Seattle to spend their last two years as part of the graduating class, and they will uh, be, and become doctors. And that way, the rotations are made back through their own states so we can get them back. The primary emphasis and the thing they've done best is to develop family practitioners who will return to where they came from. So we have a huge rural area. The University of Washington serves one quarter of the United States, so uh, uh, land mass wise. And this is some of the uh, airlift Northwest bringing patients from everywhere. And that's how Harborview became so established. And the HMOs also began here. So this, is, this was the group health system, which has now recently been bought by Kaiser Permanente. So we are, in this city, we have a major HMO that works. Finally, <clears throat> all of the malpractice uh, problem began in the 80s. And we had that, and this was all uh, sort of about the same time Reagan was uh, voted in. <clears throat> and then what I want to talk about is the Scoliosis Research Society, because Seattle was very involved in the scoliosis. We have, in this group, we have Dr. Jim Tupper, we have Dr. Mar Mullen, and we had, I'm a little debating whether Bob Florence from, from Tacoma was also involved in, uh, in that. So we may have had three members of the original 1966 scoliosis group. And, and uh, here are some pictures. This was actually in 72, but for those who can remember, this is Bob Weir, Harrington, and, uh, and uh, this is Mar Mullen, who looked like a cowboy there. And, uh, and then Jim Tupper was part of that. And now in the state of Washington, this is the registered mount, just as of yesterday. And there are 17 people registered. However, of those, there is one who has died, and there are four that have become emeritus. Uh, but the good news is there's four new candidate members. So we are pretty steady in our membership. And we really consider that to be our, our basic fraternity for this uh, spinal deformity. <clears throat> and. Uh, there we go. But remember about that time, before the scoliosis really got going, we already had a movement in Milwaukee to start the, uh, with Blount and Moe, who had developed the brace. And this is the brace. Not many of you have seen it, but um, it, was a, it went around your neck, and it went down to your pelvis as a leather part, and it was worn 23 out of 24 hours a day. These are uh, pictures of someone with a, a big curve, probably of 65 or 70 degrees. And the only problem this brace really formed was a problem with, the, with their jaw and the development of their mandible and their teeth. And so it became, uh, it became a brace that was abandoned when the uh, Boston brace came about. But this was the front piece that had it that pushed up and held these people. So they were in some traction almost. This man's Dr. Jim Tupper. He was here, went to University of Pennsylvania, came, did his residency at the University of Washington, 
and he was my uh, partner, and I joined him, and, um, and he was part of the original membership. Now, these people weren't trained with a spine fellowship. <clears throat> they were trained by Paul Harrington. They, uh, Paul Harrington was starting in Texas with polio, and doctors would go down and see him sort of on a, uh, just like this course, but they'd stay maybe a week, do a couple cases, come back, and then they would continue to relate to Dr. Harrington. Dr. Harrington came here and operated, and uh, I have some of those original cases. <clears throat> Paul Harrington was a remarkable guy. He was really an Olympic uh, uh, track man and basketball player, captain of both sports, and was out of Kansas. That led to Mark Asher. Mark Asher is really a priest. He is a, an incredible guy who, um, who has established a library for Paul Harrington. And the Paul Harrington Library is in, uh, <clears throat> is in uh, Kansas City, and he has been the collector of all of the information about it. And as a result of that, he wrote, he wrote a paper called Dogged Persistence of Poliomyelitis about Harrington. But actually, the dogged person is him, the author, because the book is an incredible book it's a, uh, <clears throat> it was really took up 26 hours a day for him for the last five years to get this done. <clears throat> and he's done it all with thyroid cancer. And I only mention that because we've been looking at that pretty carefully. And uh, <clears throat> as a sidelight, we, uh, we now have four members of the Scoliosis Research Society, including two presidents who have thyroid cancer. So as a warning, Radiation is not good, and uh, and so that's it. <clears throat> These are an example of some of the early polio cases that he did. And remember, he and his engineer worked out this distraction system, which is still a good system. And this is the kind of fusion that he would get. However, it had the problem of being distraction in the lumbar spine, which then led to the flat back problems that we have to some extent. But then was a club that became the Isola Club. And the Isola Club was a group of us who developed the Isola instrumentation, which had a connector <clears throat> from the pedicle screw to the rod. And it allowed a lot of rotational adjustment and made uh, life a lot easier. I want to bring up these two people because Jake Heineck was probably the first person to go from the back to the front and do the eggshell osteotomies. And he, uh, and he is a remarkable guy from uh, North Carolina. <clears throat> and the one on the right is Dr. Art Steffi. And Steffi uh, was out of Cleveland, and he was actually a hand surgeon who then switched to spine. And he had a very thick skin and could move ahead with a lot of very novel stuff. And basically, he formed the Acromed Corporation. And the x-ray on the right is a case that I did here. I, the first case of pedicle screws used west of Cleveland was here in Seattle by me in December of 1985. We did four cases. This was one of them. I think you can still see the tape on the box. Um, and uh, so we did these together. Remember that we all got sued. I got sued for 350 cases that took up a whole room full of paper, and, um, and it was a big deal. This was the argument. Where did the spine screw start? And Art Steffi said, it's a bone screw. And we had screws, the same screws he used, actually, in the shoulder and in other places, just to prove that it was the same screw. But the FDA came down against it, and they sued or the tort across the country. And so this little company, Acromed, was, uh, was sued for $100 million. And in order to survive, <clears throat> it was sold with the liability. And it became incorporated into Johnson & Johnson 
and it has been a boom for them, and it was a great thing, but it was a very punishing deal. And because three months later, the FDA came out and said the pedicle screw was the best instrumentation for the spine. So it was lawyers who had run up this thing all the way up, collected $100 million, <clears throat> and then walked, and we were left with uh, a bill we couldn't pay. <clears throat> so that is an interesting part of a, and, uh, there's nobody who has searched this more than, uh, than Mark Asher. Another character is George Bagby. George Bagby was a, came from a veterinarian hospital in Texas, came to Spokane <clears throat> after going to Temple Medical School and then going to Mayo Clinic. The Mayo Clinic, he wrote his thesis as a, uh, as a resident and developed the Bagby plate. The Bagby plate was the first compression plate ever developed in orthopedics. And it came from the backyard of his, uh, of his house when, he, when the screen wouldn't close on the back door. And he realized that it had worn through, the screws had sort of worn through the hinges. And when he took a screwdriver and tightened it up, he could bring the door back to its normal position. So he took advantage of an oblong a hole that was tapered so that he would then be able to self-tighten the screw and bring the two edges of the bone together in compression. <clears throat> it was really A.O. who stole that and sold it out of Switzerland. And he was never able, <clears throat> he was ne never able to control that, but he did neuterize the AO people, so that they could not, they could not own the patent for it. And so it's, it's great stories about some of this instrumentation <clears throat> that you might enjoy. <clears throat> so George Bagby went on to have a horse, to be in the horsing world, and he was called in to see patients, the horses that were, that were run for about a quarter of a mile, and then they would, their knees would collapse. So they wanted him to arthroscope the knees, and when he went and looked at it, he said, I don't think it's coming from the knees. I think it's coming from the spine. So they took these thoroughbred horses and put them to sleep, did a myelogram, and they had complete blocks in the cervical spine. So he looked around. They operated on this, and they got in there, and there was a space <clears throat> of about <clears throat> three quarters of an inch between the discs, between the vertebral bodies, and it took a little bit at an angle. And he looked around, and basically, decided that a shotgun shell, shotgun shell would be about the right size. And so they cut holes in the outside of a shotgun shell and filled it with bone and put it in. And that's how the cage was developed. And the cage, the, and the cage was eventually sold to a Swiss company, and he developed the uh, anterior cage <clears throat> as a result of treating horses. And he had the absolute perfect outcome study because these horses couldn't mount. And if you're, if you're dealing with, with uh, thoroughbred horses, they cannot be artificially inseminated. They have, to, they have to be videoed mounting. And so he had, he had pictures of the horses not being able to mount, and then he took the pictures after the surgery, and they could mount. That's a real outcome study, OK? And, uh, <clears throat> and so. Uh, this developed into the cage that we know today. It, it took on many different uh, chapters, but uh, I have all the original stuff. I have all the original uh, um, works. He just died in the last year. And he took his money and built a hospital in Bangladesh. And I've been there four times, I think, to uh, operate and work over there. So now faced with cases like this, and this is what this whole meeting's about, is how distorted, and we don't see as many of these really, really fully untreated cases, but they're, these are all cases that I did. And here, you know, you get into these 100 degree, 115 degree curves. This is another problem. This is what happened with steroids. This is rheumatoid arthritis. We almost don't see it now. So for people here in the crowd, these people destroy all their joints, and they end up with surgery. And this was uh, actually Jens Chapman operated on this patient. 
and they fail, they break, there's no bone, there's no anchor position. Steroids make bone really difficult. And when you get below a density of minus 2.5, every case that I ever dealt with failed. They failed either above or below or in the, in the area. And, and, uh, and so these are really horrible uh, cases. And then you have the big kyphosis cases that need to be uh, done. And finally, this is a paper that came out of Seattle, and I'm very proud of it, really. It's a, <clears throat> Chris Howe was one of our, uh, from South Dakota. He's, uh, Chris Howe was a resident and a fellow with us. I happen to be included in this group, but this was a review of the morbidity and mortality of doing long, long fusions. And I think it's a very sobering article. I give Jens a lot of credit for having uh, uh, <clears throat> having allowed this to be published and to put it out there for everyone to read. But basically, I'm going to show you that it was becoming increasingly common. There was perioperative risks, and the hypothesis was that we needed to look at what these comorbidities were. This guy is not going to do well having a T10 to the sacrum. And, and this was the problem. Morning, Rob. And, and uh, so he wrote this paper up, and it really came down to this. There were 104 cases. Four of them died. 17% were infected. And if you look at the complications, uh, 35 had to go back to surgery. So it was a, it's really, a, these are the specific other complications, including a full blindness. So you have a series of 104 with a blind, four dead, 35% return. And you realize that we have to do something very special to look at what, who we're operating on and then how we're operating on them and what support they need. So I, I think it's one of the real contributions. It's used as a landmark study to, uh, to go around. Finally, this in, in my life, I uh, came to Hong Kong at the end of Hudson's work. And Hudson had gone to Hong Kong from Paraguay and developed uh, the whole anterior approach. Arthur Yao was my actual professor and, and uh, <clears throat> was terrific. He had, Dr. Donald Gunn had come here from Singapore and was head of the department in Singapore and he became the liaison while I was a resident between Asia and here. And that's how I ended up doing my fellowship in Hong Kong. And that brought on two things. Because the Dwyer instrumentation that was done anteriorly was developed out of Australia. <clears throat> and so between that, we had all these cases of severe idiopathic scoliosis. And then we had this problem. And this is the tuberculosis. And I did probably four to five cases of tuberculosis a day in Hong Kong. So we, uh, and the, most of them were thoracotomies, and most of it was done anteriorly. But here is a case just to show you how destructive this is. It's an anterior, it's an anterior spine disease. For those who haven't seen it, it usually presents insidiously over a period of time. It is pulmonary to start and it is uh, spread to the spine, and it most commonly affects uh, L1, okay? And then it goes down as you go up, and then you, you can go up into the neck. You can do a lot of things. It can go everywhere. But here's a, a very early MRI which shows the amount of fluid collection that goes with this. So these are big psoas abscesses, and they will fill in and actually sometimes come to the groin. This was the procedure at that time, to go anteriorly and put in rib graft and then to do a simple Harrington instrumentation. We learned how to do some of these in one position. So we would do, do the front and the back at the same time. Here he is post-operatively. You can see the two incisions. And he, he completely recovered. <clears throat> now, finally, these are the Department of uh, 
Dr. Clausen in 1964 came aboard and developed a freestanding department of orthopedics. Orthopedics was part of general surgery up until then. And these are the people who followed him, <coughs> including uh, Jens and now Howard Chansky. And each has made major contributions. This was Dr. Clausen, who was my, uh, my professor. This is Ted Hansen, Rick Matson, Jens Chapman and now uh, Dr. Chansky. So um, a lot's in the past, and enough's in the present, questions of the future. We're running very fast. So if all this happened in 150 years, you can imagine what will happen in the next 20 years. And we're not going to be doing what we're trained to do now. It's going to be uh, really different. Thanks.